All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Hope you're doing good. Uh, today, I have a couple of thoughts that I wanted to share with, with, the, with the team here, with the cool beans here. One study that I have been seeing, and this was tweeted at me by someone on the Twitter, that study had gone into the types of the immune responses in various COVID-19 patients or the variety of the immune responses. And I think that this is a very fascinating thing to look at. So let me share the study itself. All right, so hope, hopefully you can see the study. The study is, uh, and a side note, somebody would, was getting upset with me that I show the studies and I don't uh, tell them where these are. Whenever I show a study, there is a link always in the description. So you can find the study description in the description. Secondly, I always show the title of the study. So if you wanted to search for it, you can search for that as well. This is a study that is deep immune profiling of COVID-19 patients reveals distinct immunotypes with therapeutic complications. So this is, uh, sorry, implications. This is 15 July. So it is a pretty recent study, yesterday's study, I believe. And the study is uh, conducted by, uh, it is conducted in the US. What I wanted to show us, and here is a today's discussion a lot of this is going to be around two basic ideas that I've been uh, thinking about for some time. And now there are studies around that as well. And that is number one, are the people actually responding differently? Of course, we know that, that they are responding differently because some people develop cytokine storms and some do not. Still, the, the reason that I think that they are responding differently is that the folks who are ending up in cytokine storm, there may be an incorrect pathway taken for them for the response. And maybe there is a different pathway that should have been taken. So this study actually takes us in that kind of a, uh, that kind of a path to think. So let's do this. I'm going to, first of all, draw this diagram that I draw all the time. And that is, let's say this is a macrophage. My system seems to be a little slow today. So this is a little macrophage. Macrophage eats up a coronavirus here. Then it connects with the T cells, naive T cell, which we know that in the presence of interleukin-4, this naive T cell becomes T helper 2 cell. And T helper 2 cell will then activate B cells. This is that diagram which I make almost every single time. On the other hand, in the presence of interleukin-12, we end up on the pathway of T helper 1 cells, which then cause cytotoxic T cells to become activated. Now, what I would like us to kind of uh, look at these pathways this way, that this is a pathway, the cytotoxic T cell pathway is the pathway that is engaged to kill the cells where the virus or pathogen or cancer is present. So we have done this discussion many times in the past that let's say this is a, this is a cell. This cell is filled with coronaviruses. Because of that, this cell is going to have some proteins that are present on, on the normal cells. These proteins will not be present. Why they are not present? Because the, because the virus has taken over the machinery of the cell and cell is not able to make its own um, proteins that well. So the result is that this cell, for example, like we have hair, this cell will not have its hair. Where did those hair go? Where did those proteins go away? The cell's machinery is not working for the cell. So the cytotoxic T cell and natural killer type cells, they can figure these things out and then they can kill the cell. So here in this case, the cytotoxic T cell will engage with the antigen presentation on a normal sick cell. And this engagement would then in turn cause the T helper 2 cell to kill this cell. And we have done that discussion that this killing is done by first throwing perforins 
and then granzymes, correct? And B cells will produce antibodies. So this pathway, we have talked about it many, many times. Here is the, here is the essence of the study. And I think today's discussion is going to be really important because one, from this discussion, we can figure out what are vaccines going to do to us. Secondly, we can figure out what happens when the virus arrives in our body. Various people have various uh, behaviors, their immune systems behaviors. And then how can we improve our management of SARS-CoV-2 based on this information. So let's look at it. There is a comment here um, from Barbara. Good evening, Dr. Mobin. I have to say yesterday's lecture was so informative with your special guest, Dr. Rockstar Merrick, a very, a very coherent collective of so much valuable information. So give me one second. I have a patient who are uh, in an urgent need. So I'm gonna put you on mute and just very quickly Sorry, guys, I have a patient who who needed help in emergency. I may have to discontinue my lecture if they did not feel better and I have to manage them. So let's continue with our discussion. So thank you very much for this comment. Yes, yesterday's talk was really, really great. So back here, the there are T helper two subset of the, disc, of the response. Then there can be T helper one subset of the response, and then there can be no response. So if I draw the population, so let's say this is a community. We are all part of this community. First thing to consider is that in this community, children are usually less susceptible. That doesn't mean that they don't get the infection. That simply means that when they get the infection, they can actually handle it much better. And what is the reason for that? We had that discussion done in the past. The reason is, number one, they may have less ACE2 receptors in the, their nasopharyngeal area. So the binding places for the virus are less. Secondly, we talked about it that children have more natural killer cells than adults. And their natural killer cells respond to the virus much quicker and better and kind of contain it very fast. Thirdly, we talked about it that children have frequent respiratory infections. So their immune system is kind of trained. We call it trained me memory on the innate arm. And that would help with the, uh, with the quick uh, control of the disease. So this is one group, children. Then in the remaining group, what the study found, the study that I'm, I'm showing here, they found, and I'm summarizing it, they did a very deep study of various kinds of immune system and their subsystem cells. But I'm going to just say it this way, that they found one type of patients who had B cell response. That means these patients produced antibodies. And this is what we see a lot. And this is what we are saying that, hey, if we are giving vaccines, the patient has to produce antibodies. And then we have to count for the antibodies afterwards as well to see if the patient is protected or not. So this is something that we are all used to and are expecting. Then, then here is the interesting thing. They also found that in another subset, and I'm going to make it orange. That doesn't mean it is bad. It's just a different color I want to use. Another subset had the T helper one pathway engaged. That means cytotoxic pathway was engaged. Now, the folks who had cytotoxic pathway engaged or CD8 pathway engaged, their B cell pathway was less active. And the folks who had the B cell pathway engaged, their CD, cytotoxic T cell pathway was less active. And finally, there were some folks 
who did not develop any significant immune response at all. So the whole spectrum of the immune responses to the SARS-CoV-2 are available. Children's spectrum is different immune response. Then in adults, the immune responses go from almost negligible immune response to immune response that is B cell uh, dominant to immune response that is cytotoxic T cell dominant. That is what is the discussion here. So if you see here, and I think you can all or already start thinking about the implications of this. So if I go down here, it's a very detailed study, a beautiful study. So what they're saying is, look at this. Patients with robust activated and proliferation of activation and prolifer proliferation of CD4 T cells with the CD8 exhausted T cells. So this is one, one side. Then the other one is with memory B cell and pr plasma B cell. So here, this one CD4 T cell and exhausted CD8 T cell, this is the memory B cell site. CD8 cells are exhausted, B cells are going to be active. The second type is where CD8 cells are actually much more better and the B cell response is less. And the third one is an immunotype largely lacking detectable lymphocyte response to infection, suggesting a failure of the immune system. So three kinds of responses can come in. Now their further discussion is actually very interesting. And the discussion they are doing is, and I think we can think aloud with that as well. The discussion is, does this mean that everyone who has one type over the other, does this mean that this pathway is the right pathway? Or is this pathway the right pathway? So this is their question that the folks who go in the cytokine storm, what is their immune profile, immune system response profile? And maybe we can then look at various people's immune systems tendencies and based on that we can decide who to treat aggressively and who may not need the aggressive treatment this is a very important thing the second important thing is that we keep saying that as we would have anti um, vaccines we keep saying that fine we'll have vaccines vaccines would allow us to develop so let's say this is a community we are saying that fine, when we'll give vaccines, we will have a bunch of people become immune and then we will have herd immunity for the rest of them. But the question is, is it necessary that the vaccine would always in everybody take us to the B cell pathway? If the body is responding differently and we are going towards a T cell pathway, maybe when we deliver a vaccine that would also not go to the B cell pathway, it might go to the T cell pathway as well. So that means the one more thing that is interesting is that for herd immunity or to understand that how many people have become sick and recovered, we normally do the testing and no nowadays we say 10 to 14 percent, 10 to 15 percent people have become sick and recovered based on the antibodies that we see in general population. But how about this? The people who have become immune or who have received the, who have become sick and, and then recovered, we are only counting their antibodies. We are not looking at those folks who had become sick, who developed cytotoxic response and then recovered. And they are not going to show a lot of antibodies. But this response has actually protected them as well. What is not known yet is that, is it the cytotoxic T response that predominantly causes the cytokine storm uh, activation or is it the B cell response with further uh, segregation in it which causes the cytokine storm? Another thing that they found which is very fascinating for me as a doctor, they found that in, in a subset B cells were active making amino antibodies but the T cells that activate them were missing. This pathway was missing. And so spec they speculated that that means that there is a possible immune response where B cell is connecting with the antigen and is directly becoming activated by cytokines and chemokines without T cells doing a lot of help. 
So that is also another uh, possibility. And uh, there is a question, uh, why don't they show any antibodies? So according to the study, they call it a failure of the immune system. So if you see here, they are saying an immune immunotype largely lacking detectable lymphocyte response to infection, suggesting a failure of the immune activation. And maybe that is also an important thing to consider that maybe some people are not going to mount correct immune response. Now, the immune response types, number one, if I can mark them here, this is what we are used to talking about on daily basis. That is immune response type one. Second type immune response where B cell is activated without T cell actually becoming too much activated. Second type. Third type, T cell becoming activated. And fourth type, no response. So the things to think about are number one, when we are doing antibody testing, we are probably only testing a subset of the people. Number two, when we are going to vaccinate people, we are probably only create in a subset of the people a response that we are familiar with, that is antibody response. Others may not have that response. Number three, there are folks who go into cytokine storm. Which pathway out of these four is the one that allows, it enables, or that makes a person go in that route? Can we look at that response and figure out who to treat differently? And maybe, and this is my conjecture, this is my... Um, me thinking aloud. So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Maybe the antibody route may not be the right route. Maybe our body has to go the cytotoxic pathway and that is the right pathway where the symptoms are less. We handle the virus and we move on happily with our life. Maybe the B cell route is not the right route. So again, I do not have the answers for that, but I wanted to make sure that we discuss this study and it's a very high level understanding of it that how they are looking at the responses. So if you see here, they have put, so this is one observation about the immune responses. Another observation is a second key observation from these studies was the robust PB plasma, plasma blast are the B cell responses. So they are saying that in some people, the B cell response, this side response has been much more robust compared to other people. And maybe that is what causes a cytokine storm. Similarly, uh, here they had one more um, understanding. A striking feature of some patients with strong T and B cell activation and proliferation was the durability of the response. So another thing that they saw was that it is possible that the response that in somebody else starts, maybe it is T cell response or B cell response. And when I say B cell response, I mean antibodies. And when I say T cell, it is cytotoxic T cell. Although B cell response has T cell path in its path as well. So maybe it is, or I should say more accurately, humoral response or cytotoxic response. Either way, it is, they're saying that in some people, the immune system just becomes autonomous. It just keeps going. It does not know when to stop. This is the same discussion Dr. Marek was doing yesterday. And that probably gives rise to amplified immune system giving cytokine storms, or that gives rise to a sustaining immune system making long haulers. So how do we interfere, intervene with that sustenance of the immune system and stop that? So this was another of the observation they had. And look over here, they're saying that this may be the reason that the, the people are going in the cytokine storms because the immune system does not know when to stop. Then an additional major finding was the ability to connect immune features, not only to the disease severity at the time of sampling, but also the trajectory of disease severity changing over time. So what they had done was that in people, they measured immune response. So let's say this is a person who is, who is sick with COVID-19. They would measure their immune system response on, let's say, day zero. Then they will measure it on, let's say, day seven, then measure it again at a different date. And so now they can say in a chronological time frame, they can they could see how the immune system response was evolving or changing. Although their their uh, reading was that not a lot of immune system response changed, but still they had done that study as well. And finally, this is what is their takeaway. 
Nevertheless, these findings provoke the idea of the tailoring clinical treatment of future immune-based clinical trials to patients whose immunotype suggests greater be potential benefit. So if I, if I can wrap up the discussion for today, what they're saying is that people have varying immune type responses. I had done one, I had done one thought, I had thought aloud in one of my previous lectures where I had said, maybe we should take the immune system cells from a person, have the SARS-CoV-2 antigen present, and then see how does the immune system responds. And then based on that, we should decide what kind of medicine to give. This is a study which kind of is having a simpler, similar thinking by the authors as well. So please realize, I'm just going to summarize it. Children have a different way of responding. Adults, we thought were all going to respond with the antibody response, but they also have three groups. One that is giving an antibody response. In that, there are two groups. One is antibody response with the help of helper T cells. Other is the antibody response without the help of or with less help of the helper T cells. Then the second group in the adults is people who are responding to T cell through the cytotoxic T cells. We don't measure them. We don't count them in herd immunity. We do not look at them. We cannot say they have become protected. We keep looking for antibodies in all cases. So these folks are actually missed. And then there is a third group which does not have a response at all or negligible response. So I wanted to make sure that this study came out yesterday. It was very interesting. It gives us an idea for how to look at vaccination, how to look at antibody tests, how to look at herd immunity, how to tailor our response to the disease. So uh, I think this is the discussion for today. We will continue tomorrow. My apologies, Dr. Zelenko was busy today, so he could not join. We would have the time again and we'll have him. And in the next coming days, we may have Dr. Poor Hassan from Liron Lemap from Cytodine once more, and we may have Dr. Bruce Patterson on this Monday with us. So thank you very much. See you again. Stay happy, safe, and healthy. And please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you very much. Bye.